Well, hey, everybody, I'm Adam Shell, the pastor at Melbourne Heights, and I want to welcome you as we come together to worship online today. And as we get started this morning, I want to encourage you to interact with us throughout our time together. You can get started right now if you're joining us on Facebook or on YouTube by sharing this post. By sharing the post, you're going to be inviting your friends to come and worship with us and to come and worship with you today. You can also interact with us on Facebook by using the emojis that are there. You can hit the buttons you know, to let us know when you like something that was said or if you loved a song that we sung or if something that happens makes you laugh along the way. You can also use the comments thread on Facebook or on YouTube to ask any questions or to make any comments that you might have during our time together. And if you do have a question today, I want you to know that every Monday in our church's private Facebook group, I take a little bit of time to answer those questions for you. And you can join that group by visiting facebook.com slash groups slash Melbourne Heights. Now today at Melbourne Heights, we're continuing on in our sermon series where we're exploring some of the stories from the life of the prophet Elijah. And we're exploring stories from Elijah's life because he lived in a time that's not that different than what we've been facing in 2020. So Elijah's story begins, the people of Israel have just come out of their golden era, and now they've turned into some more tumultuous times. So today we're going to be exploring one of the stories from his life to see what we can learn about how we can continue to persevere in our faith even through difficult times when our fortunes change. So we'll get into that in a few minutes, but before we get to that, I'm going to turn it over to one of our deacons, Sherry Talbot, to lead us in a word of prayer, and then our church musicians will lead us in our opening songs. So let's worship God together. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, as we pray to you today, Lord, we thank you for your love your blessings, and your guidance. Give us strength to do your will and show love to others. Help us to show compassion to others and to not be afraid in a world that is so uncertain at this time. But we know that we can always count on you, Lord. Help us to remember that you are our strength and the one that will get us through this difficult time. And now open our minds and our hearts as we hear your words, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning and welcome to worship. Let's praise the Lord together.
It was a long-awaited Friday night that was four years in the making. For the previous three years, I had spent every Friday night during the fall standing on the sidelines of football fields, waiting for my chance to get out there and play. And just a couple of weeks earlier, on the first Friday night of that season, my dream had finally come true. I got to take the field as the starting right tackle on my team's offensive line. But that's not the Friday night when this particular story takes place. This particular story takes place a few Friday nights later when my team took the field against our biggest rivals. I can still remember running out onto the field that Friday night. I can still remember hearing the roar of the crowd in the bleachers as our pet band played our fight song. I can still remember jogging out onto the field for our team's first offensive possession. I can still remember the battles on the line as each side tried to gain an edge. I can still remember just how close that game was, and I can still remember the importance of every single play and every single possession. But none of those things are what I remember the most about that Friday night. What I remember the most from that Friday night happened pretty late in the game, well into the fourth quarter. My team had a small lead at that point as our offense came back out onto the field. Time was running out, so we knew that if we could just score on that possession, that we'd probably win the game. And as each play was called and ran, we marched closer and closer to the end zone, and closer and closer to a touchdown, and closer and closer to a victory. And I'll never forget the play that we ran when we were 15 yards away from the end zone. It was a running play that was coming right behind me. So... We came up to the line, and I got down in my stance. When the ball was snapped, I exploded off, to the, off the line into the defender standing across from me, pushing him down the line as far away from the play as I could. Using all of my strength, I was even able to drive him down to the ground into a pile of other players that was laying there. While all of that was happening, our running back was managing to avoid all of the chaos, and he eluded the other team's defenders that were trying to bring him down. He was eventually able to cut and weave his way into the end zone, scoring a vital six points for our team, increasing our lead, and giving us a really good chance to win the game. But that touchdown isn't even what I remembered the most from that Friday night. What I remember the most happened just seconds after that touchdown was scored and the referee blew his whistle. The play had come to an end. But the pile of players that I was a part of it remained on the ground, and each one of us was trying to free his body from the pile. And I had managed to push myself back up onto my feet, but I wasn't able to get myself free from the pile because somebody down at the bottom of that pile, well, they were holding on to my ankle. And that's when the moment that I remember the most happened. In his attempt to climb out of the pile, Big Joe, who was the offensive guard who played right beside me, he started to roll over. And let's just say that Big Joe's nickname wasn't one of those ironic nicknames that we give people sometimes, you know, like when you call a bald guy curly. No. Joe earned the moniker Big because of his six foot four, 300 plus pound frame. And as Big Joe rolled over, he ran right into my knee. And my knee didn't stand a chance. 
His 300 pounds buckled my knee from the outside in. So as my teammates were rushing off to the sideline so that our special teams could come out to try for the extra point, I was laying back down on the ground in my own personal pile, this time, unable to stand up at all. Just a few seconds later, the medical personnel had rushed out onto the field and they were beside me poking and prodding to diagnose exactly what was wrong. Soon they were helping me up from the ground and with my arms draped over the shoulders of a physical therapist and an EMT, we made our way back over to the bench where I gingerly stretched out my leg for a little further evaluation and a whole lot of ice. That moment, I knew that I wasn't going back out onto the field again that Friday night. But I also knew that there was a chance that I'd never get back out onto the football field again. So, I wasn't just feeling the sting of pain in my knee. I also had a sting of pain in my heart, knowing that my dream of playing football might have just come to an end. So there wasn't much that anyone could do in that moment to comfort me. There wasn't any medicine that was going to work quickly enough to take away all the pain that I was feeling in my knee. There weren't any words of comfort that would take away the heartache that I was feeling either. And then I saw him making his way past the fence that held spectators back away from the players. He was walking toward me with concern and love in his eyes. He was my dad. Now, I know that my dad talked with me and the medical personnel when he got down to the sidelines, but to be honest with you, I don't remember anything that he said. What I do remember is my dad standing right there, right beside me for the rest of the game. As the game continued on and our rivals made one final push to try to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, I remember looking back to watch my dad raising his arms up and down over his head, trying to get the crowd in the bleachers to stand up and cheer our team on to a win. Now, like most teenage boys, I was completely embarrassed at the time by what my dad was doing. After all, nobody wanted to see their dad raising the roof back in the 90s when raising the roof was still a thing that people actually did. But as the years have passed, I now look back on that moment fondly because I know that even when I was at the lowest point of my football career, that my dad was right there, raising his arms up and down to try to help raise my spirits. In the end, my team held on and we did win that game. But the win isn't even what mattered from that night. That Friday night, I went from one of the highest points in my life to one of the lowest. So what mattered was that my dad was there for me when my fortunes changed. Now, over the last couple of weeks here at Melbourne Heights, we've been talking about how we can keep moving forward when our fortunes change in our lives. And we've been doing that by taking a look at a few stories from the life of the prophet Elijah. So let me take just a couple of seconds here to recap Elijah's story for you up to this point. Elijah's story began about 2,900 years ago in the land of Israel, when Israel was ruled by King Ahab. Now, like any other king, Ahab wanted to strengthen his nation and to protect his people. So Ahab did what every ruler and political leader would, would have done to make that happen. Ahab sought out alliances with other powerful nations. And he was able to become allies with the king of Tyre. And to cement their new alliance, Ahab married the daughter of that king, a woman named Jezebel. But Ahab's new queen, she wasn't content to just sit at the king's hand and to enjoy all of the privileges and perks that come along with being royalty. Instead, Jezebel wanted to help her new country enter into a new age and a better era, at least in her opinion. So that meant that Jezebel started bringing aspects of her country and her culture with her to Israel to help the backwoods people of this Mediterranean country gain a little bit more culture and a little more sophistication. And she started by bringing her gods with her to Israel. Now, the new queen must have wondered how anyone in their right mind could ever believe in a god that was as utterly demanding as the god of Israel especially when Jezebel's gods required far less from the people who worshipped them. So the new queen, she went about bringing in new priests and new priestesses to teach the people of Israel about these new gods, the gods of Baal. Well, 
it's needless to say, but the God of Israel was not very happy that the people of Israel started worshiping these other gods. So God sent a drought on the entire land, not allowing any rain or dew or even mist to fall on all of Israel for three years. And it's safe to say that this prolonged drought, it didn't help make Jezebel a bigger fan of the God of Israel. And it also didn't make her a bigger fan of God's prophet or the person that God used to speak on his behalf. That person was Elijah. As a matter of fact, the drought made Jezebel want to kill Elijah. So for a period of time, Elijah fled from the long-reaching arms of the king and queen of Israel, only to return to challenge the gods that Jezebel had brought with her from Tyre to a showdown on Mount Carmel. And that was what we heard about last week in the sermon. Atop of Mount Carmel, Elijah threw down the gauntlet. He challenged the priests of Baal to call on their gods to send down fire to consume a sacrifice that was placed on an altar before them. And the priests of Baal, they didn't hesitate to accept this challenge because they knew that their gods, the gods of Baal, were gods of fire. But lo and behold, no matter what the priests did that day to call Baal into action, nothing happened to their sacrifice. Hours went by that day until Elijah had finally had enough. So Elijah decided that he would prove once and for all that the God of Israel, our God, is the one true God. So Elijah ordered an altar to be repaired and a sacrifice to be placed on top of it. Then Elijah demanded that a ditch be dug around the whole thing. And then Elijah told the people to go and gather water and to pour it over the entire sacrifice until the ditch that they had just dug was completely overflowing. And then, with a simple prayer, Elijah called out to God, and that water-drenched altar and the sacrifice were consumed by fire in an instant. So that's what's taken place so far in Elijah's story. But it's far from the end of his story. So today I want to pick up where this story left off. So let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19. We'll start reading in verse 1. Here's what it says. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, how he had killed all Baal's prophets with the sword. Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah with this message. May the gods do whatever they want to me if by this time tomorrow I haven't made your life like one of them. Elijah was terrified. He got up and he ran for his life. He arrived at Beersheba in Judah and left his assistant there. He himself went farther on into the desert, a day's journey. He finally sat down under a solitary broom bush. He longed for his own death. It's more than enough, Lord. Take my life because I'm no better than my ancestors. He lay down and slept under that solitary broom bush. Then suddenly a messenger tapped him and said to him, Get up, eat something. Elijah opened his eyes and saw flatbread baked on glowing coals and a jar of water right by his head. He ate and drank and then went back to sleep. The Lord's messenger returned a second time and tapped him. Get up, the messenger said. Eat something, because you have a difficult road ahead of you. Elijah got up, ate and drank, and went refreshed by that food for forty days and nights until he arrived at Horeb, God's mountain. There he went into a cave, and he spent the night. The Lord's word came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? Elijah replied, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces, because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars, and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they want to take my life too. The Lord said, Go out and stand at the mountain before the Lord. The Lord is passing by. A very strong wind tore through the mountains and broke apart the stones before the Lord. But the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. After the fire... There was a sound, thin, quiet. 
When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his coat. He went out and stood at the cave's entrance. A voice came to him and said, Why are you here, Elijah? He said, I've been very passionate for the Lord God of heavenly forces because the Israelites have abandoned your covenant. They have torn down your altars and they have murdered your prophets with the sword. I'm the only one left. And now they want to take my life too. The Lord said to him, go back through the desert to Damascus. Now, if you've spent much time around the church over the years, there's a pretty good chance that you've heard this story before. But no matter how many times that I hear this story, the part of it that always stands out to me is the way that God shows up in the last place that we'd expect. In this story, God shows up in the last place that we'd expect. We would look for God in the wind, or we would look for God in the earthquake, or we would look for God in the fire, but in this story, God is in a sound that is thin and quiet. But you know what? Sometimes God does use a mighty wind to speak. Just think about the story of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples like a great wind. And sometimes God speaks to us through an earthquake too. Just think about God's appearance to the people of Israel at Mount Sinai during their exodus. And sometimes God speaks to us through a fire as well. Just think about the burning bush that God used to speak to Moses. So maybe, just maybe, there's more to this story than the sound that is thin and quiet or the still, small voice that we like to talk so much about when we typically read this passage. Maybe this story is about something bigger than the way that God chooses to speak to Elijah. Maybe this story is here to show us the same thing that my dad showed to me on that Friday night 21 years ago. In this story, Elijah has gone from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows. Elijah had just stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the gods of Baal on Mount Carmel, and Elijah had come out victorious when God sent his all-consuming fire down to burn that sacrifice. And on top of all of that, when the flames came down, the people of Israel realized their mistake, and they had returned to worshiping God. But in this story, Elijah still feels like no one is listening to him. He feels like no one believes in the God that he has been trying to tell them about. And if that weren't bad enough, Elijah also realizes that he's ended up on Jezebel's bad side, and that she wants his head served up on a silver platter. So I get it. I understand why Elijah runs off in the story. I understand why Elijah wants to bury his head in the proverbial sand and hide. I understand why Elijah is depressed and just ready to give up. But I also understand something that Elijah seems to have forgotten in the story. Elijah has forgotten that God was with him. God was with him. Even in the darkest moment of his life, when he felt like everyone and everything had turned against him, God was with Elijah. And you know what else? God wasn't just with Elijah. God was with Elijah the same way that my dad was with me on that Friday night all those years ago. My dad wasn't just standing beside me. He was there raising his arms up and down, trying to fire up a crowd. And God, God was with Elijah doing the exact same thing for him. God was raising his arms up and down trying to fire up his prophet. Because God didn't want Elijah to be stuck in that dark and difficult time. God wanted Elijah to make it through. So even though Elijah felt helpless, even though Elijah felt all alone, God was there with Elijah and for Elijah. And when life gets tough for you, when your fortunes change overnight, God is there with you and for you too. God is there with you in the midst of a global pandemic when you're worried about your health and the health of your loved ones. And God is there with you when the economy gets flipped upside down and you don't know how you're going to make ends meet. God is there. God is with you, no matter how dark or how difficult your life might seem. And God is there to help you make it through to the other side. That's actually how the rest of this particular story from Elijah's life ends. 
when God sends Elijah back to Damascus, God sends him there to anoint two new kings and the next great prophet of Israel. So when Elijah was standing on that mountaintop, feeling abandoned and alone, God knew exactly what Elijah needed to make it through. Elijah needed people on his side to get him through to the other side of the difficult times that he and his nation were facing. And God knows exactly what you need to make it through to the other side of any difficult times that you're facing too. So even if you've never felt that great wind roaring, even if you never feel the ground shaking beneath your feet, and even if you never see the flames of a raging fire, God's still there. God's still there with you. God's still there for you. God wants to help you make it through. So as we face difficult times, as our fortunes change, we need to remember that God is for us. And if God is for us, there's nothing that can stand against us. So let's cling to God and trust that God will help, help us make it through. Let's pray together. God, as we come to you in this time of prayer, we thank you for the story of Elijah. God, we thank you for just how real this story is. See, God, you know that sometimes we as followers of you, we like to pretend that once we turn our lives over to you and we start following Jesus, that everything is always perfect, that life is nothing but rainbows and sunshine. But God, the reality is, it's not. Life will always have plenty of ups and plenty of downs, God. And as people of faith, we experience those ups and downs too, just like Elijah did. In the story that we've heard over the last two weeks, Elijah experienced the highest of highs as he defeated the prophets Baal of Baal on Mount Carmel. And in the very next story, he's down in the depths, feeling like he is abandoned and alone. God, you know that we all feel that way sometimes. So remind us of the same thing that you showed us in this story from Elijah's life, that you are always with us always on our side, always for us, always trying to help us make it through, God. Because you do want what's best for us. You don't want us to be stuck in the dark and difficult places. You want us to make it to better and brighter days. So God, help us to trust in you. Help us to always remember that you are for us. And since you're for us, nothing can stand against us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. At this point in the service each week, we put this slide up on the screen to let you know how you can financially support our church. And we also like to take this time to remind you of the work and the ministry that our church is doing. One of our biggest focuses as a church over the last six months as we've been living through this pandemic is to take care of one another. So every week, myself, the rest of our staff, our deacons, we are reaching out to our congregation, just trying to touch base through phone calls, text messages, emails, or cards in the mail to make sure that everyone is doing okay. We are also continuing on our relationship with the Cabbage Patch Settlement House, and right now we're working to collect pantry items for the patch. As you can imagine, during this economic uncertainty, there are so many people that are struggling to make ends meet, so they're relying on services like food pantries, like the one at the patch, to help their families make it through. So right now we're collecting non-perishable food items as well as personal hygiene items that we're going to donate to the patch to have, that they can pass along to people that are in need in our own community. And recently, we also launched a brand new private Facebook group where we are trying to connect with each other throughout the week. In this group, we're using time to each week to share how God is blessing our lives as well as to lift up prayer concerns together. Just as another way that we can minister to you and to be the presence of God in our community. So I do encourage you to prayerfully consider how you might financially support our church and then visit mhbclouisville.com slash give. Now let me turn it back over to Leslie Brocklesby and our church musicians as they lead us in our closing song.
Before we go, I just want to take a second to thank you for joining us for worship today. And if you've been blessed by our time together, let me ask you to hit the share button on this post if you haven't done so already. I also want to let you know that next Sunday we are wrapping up this series on life lessons from Elijah. We're going to be exploring a story where the king of Israel, Ahab, steals some property uh, from one of his subjects. And we're going to see what that can teach us about how we are supposed to live out our faith even in difficult times. So we hope that you'll join us next Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. on our church website, on Facebook, or on YouTube. I also want to remind you that you can join us every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. for a midweek devotion and on Saturday mornings at 10.30 a.m. for a special time for our kids. I also want to update you on some big news here at Melbourne Heights. This past week, we were finally able to finalize the sale of our building, something that we've been working on for almost three years. Of course, we made this decision three years ago because we realized that the cost of owning and maintaining our building was keeping us from living out the mission that God has called us to do. So we finally finalized that sale. So that means that in the coming weeks, we are going to be moving out of our current building into some new office space. So you're going to see me not preaching with this bookshelf behind me for very much longer. Um, we're also going to give you guys some opportunities to come out and help with that move if you'd like to do that. And a little bit further down the road, once we've settled in a bit, we're going to give you the chance to come out and see our new offices for yourself. We'll have more updates about what the future looks like for Melbourne Heights in the weeks to come. But I did want to let you know that our sale is finalized after all this time. So I want us to celebrate that good news together, even though it is a little bit bittersweet. Now, that's all that I've got for us today. So before we go, let's join together together in a time of prayer. Let's pray together. God, we do thank you for the time that we've had together today to stop and to worship you, God. We thank you for everything that you are doing in our lives right now, God. And we as a church, we especially just want to stop right now and we just want to celebrate the fact that you have led us through the, these last three years that we, as we've been trying to sell our building so that we can free up our resources to really be the church that you have called us to be, God. So I look forward to what you have in store for us in the future. And God, constantly remind us, no matter what we're facing, whether they're the highs that we as a church get to celebrate today or the lows that we experience sometimes, that you are always with us, always by our side, God. So allow us to feel your presence in our lives. As our time today comes to an end, we pray that you watch over us and you protect us, that you keep us healthy and you keep us safe, God. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for worship, and we will see you back here next Sunday to worship God together.